Ahmed and we are with you Anna Tutova, co-founder of Coins Telegram, and our guest uh, Kenny Lee, who is co-founder of Wonder Network uh, ecosystem. They have uh, layer one for private identity and layer two for zk apps. And uh, I can congratulate you as well with your recent fundraise of twenty-five million. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. So can you tell us about your background and when and how did you get involved in the blockchain space? Uh, sure, yeah. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm Kenny and um, I've been an entrepreneur for most of my life, or professional life. Uh, I started my first company in 2011 in the cloud computing space, specifically focused around uh, infrastructure analytics and we serviced uh, businesses, enterprises, so large oil and gas, banks, uh, tech companies, the ones that everyone's familiar with. Um, and did that and got a little bit into Bitcoin mining back in 2013. And then from there, um, tried my hand at an options trading platform with a few friends, uh, for specifically for Bitcoin, uh, built an options trading platform there. And then in 2018, went to go pursue my MBA over at MIT Sloan, where I was the teaching assistant for Gary Gensler, who's oh. now the yeah, chairman of the SEC. And then uh, that's where I met uh, the co-founders of Manta Network as well. And we started working on it from there and officially launched it back in uh, late 2020. And you mentioned that you did some mining back in 2013. How did you discover mining and Bitcoin? Project? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's funny because um, I, was, I was just going to work one day because with, with cloud computing, you have a lot of servers, a lot of computers that are just sitting there doing nothing, but they still have to be on and you still have to pay for them. And so I was thinking about ways to be creative about covering the operational expense of those servers. And so uh, one day I was going to work on the subway and in the subway they hand you this little newspaper so you can read them and not be bored. Uh, this was in Boston. And so as I was reading it, one of the articles was actually talking about digital currencies and Bitcoin and this idea of mining using computers. And so that's where I started really exploring it and oh, got wow, into it. Yeah. It so it was very newspaper. random. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it wasn't like a super fancy newspaper, you know, it was just some random article in the back of the small newspaper. But yeah. that's quite unusual when yeah, some yeah, yeah. mainstream media were writing about Bitcoin back then. Exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was a pretty interesting adventure. Yeah, yeah. So what was your first impression about uh, Bitcoin? Was it just like to utilize the utility of uh, those data centers? Or did you see like a big picture that it will be like the next big thing that uh, it will be like future money or something like that? I don't think so. I didn't see it that way back then because um, it's it was extremely volatile. The, the markets were much smaller than they are today. Um, I mean, it's still volatile today, but a lot less than before. Um, and didn't really, I didn't really see many use cases of it. I think other people were using it for like, you know, gambling and dark web and all that other mm -hmm. stuff. But um, I was basically just mining and selling on exchanges. I wasn't really, mm -hmm. you know, actually using it for so anything beyond that. So you didn't keep it? Some, some, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how did the idea of starting Monta Network uh, come to you? Uh, like, what was your mission? Why did you just uh, decide to start it? Yeah, so we've been, um, we've been working on, or I've been in, in the space for a while now, and so have my co-founders. And mm -hmm. one of the problems that we really bonded on was the idea that nothing on chain is private, right? Mm -hmm. So every single transaction you do, and, and it's a big problem. People really do care about it, despite the fact that people may not say that they care about privacy. Mm -hmm. We see that a lot of on-chain interactions demonstrate that people do. Mm -hmm. So uh, for- uh, I would say more crypto people care about their privacy yes, than yes. their like, mainstream wider audience. <laughs> yeah, well that's because the mainstream wider audience has this um, preconceived notion that um, their privacy is preserved through like centralized entities, like Facebook protects their privacy, mm -hmm. like Google protects their privacy, right? Like yeah, that's how, really. what they, <laughs> right, but that's what they assume, right? They have this mm -hmm. habitual mind space, but in crypto, right, no one protects your privacy. Mm -hmm. It's fully exposed um, and people try to protect their own privacy by doing things like creating multiple wallet addresses on MetaMask, mm -hmm. right? Where they just put some assets in some and others in others. Um, but there's no like perfect way of doing so right now. And so that's just the problem we decided that we really wanted to tackle because without some solution, then I don't think the Web3 space is going anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you started the storage chain in Polkadot ecosystem. Why did you select that blockchain and why did you decide to develop in Polkadot ecosystem? Yeah, so for Manta Atlantic, our layer one, uh, we really wanted to take advantage of the actual infrastructure layer 
And so uh, we built it out as a UTXO model. We could build the, the circuits directly into the execution side. Mm -hmm. And so that was really helping with the optimization. We were able to get down the prover speed. We were able to get the, um, the scalability up as well. And so mm -hmm. that's why we wanted to go build an L1. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue with building an L1 is that you're essentially your own isolated environment. Right? You have to bring in projects, you have to you know, bridge to other ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera. And so also you have to worry about the infrastructure itself, the validators, everything. And so instead of doing all that from the ground up, we decided you know, we could join an ecosystem such as Polkadot, which mm -hmm. allows you to take advantage of things like shared security on the infrastructure side, mm -hmm. XCM for communicating with other chains, mm -hmm. right, and then bringing other ecosystems in together. And so that's, that's why we decided to go and pursue that uh, the Polkadot route for mm -hmm. the L1 Manta Atlantic. And now you launched as well your Manta Pacific, your layer two on the Celestia modular blockchain with data availability and as well mm -hmm. as office stack. So can yeah. you tell more about this? Yeah, so uh, Manta Pacific is um, specifically geared towards uh, building ZK applications. It's supposed to make building and deploying ZK applications as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. And the way that this works is that, you know, traditionally building a ZK application requires you to understand how to build a ZK circuit, how to program in Rust potentially using CIRCOM and all this other stuff. And so from a developer's point of view on the Solidity side, developers uh, or Solidity developers, they work with smart contracts, right? They may have some full stack experience to build the front end as well. But um, the point is that like they're, they're comfortable in building and deploying these types of applications, but they're not so comfortable in building out these circuits. And mm -hmm. so the barrier to entry to actually add ZK features into your applications um, is very high. And so we're removing that barrier to make it easy for even Solidity developers mm -hmm. to just take these features, add them in, integrate them with very little change in how they're actually doing or building these smart contracts so that they can actually build these ZK applications in mm -hmm. just a few hours rather than several months. So how do you combine this layer one and layer two, like uh, for which use cases layer one use and for which use cases layer two? Yeah, so I, I think you said it at the beginning, right? So the L1 is more so focused on the identity side, so mm -hmm. on-chain private identity, and the L2 is more so focused on the application layer. So we provide the tooling for applications to integrate ZK features mm -hmm. um, and so that they can deploy on Manta Pacific. And if you're not an application, you're just trying to uh, utilize uh, on-chain identity, then you can use Manta Atlantic. And uh, you're as well quite active in digital identity space, and we've minted like over 300,000 uh, ZK SDT sold on tokens. Yeah. Uh, so, where do people use uh, those uh, ZK SDTs? What are the use cases? Yeah, so um, the ZK SBTs are particularly interesting because, sorry, my hair is kind of a mess today. As usual, it's always a mess. But um, they, they, they're, they're particular because. Um, an SBT, a soulbound token, right? It's just a, an NFT that you can't trade. And so mm -hmm. it becomes linked to your wallet address and it becomes part of your wallet identity. But the issue here is that that identity is fully public. And mm -hmm. so when you verify uh, or when you connect to an application to prove something, um, then the application also sees your wallet address, it sees all your assets. And so mm -hmm. one good example of this is um, Binance. So Binance, they have Binance account bound tokens, which they issue as SBTs to any users who have KYC on Binance. Mm -hmm. And the issue with that is that, you know, once the user gets the Binance account bound token after KYCing, they still can't use it with other applications because then the other applications see their Binance chain account. They mm -hmm. see their assets, their NFTs and everything, and people want to still preserve their privacy. Mm -hmm. And so having an, a ZK SBT, a privacy preserving version of it that allows you to verify that you've been KYC'd on Binance mm -hmm. without actually revealing any of your asset details, right? I think mm -hmm. that's the sort of perfect form of on-chain privacy that we're going for. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there will be bigger adoption maybe by the governments with uh, these ZK SDTs for some government services or something like that? I would, I would hope so. I think at the beginning, it's not going to be directly integrated with government, but it mm -hmm. could be integrated with you know, government tools that exist today. Um, because we already see that in KYC, right? Passports, driver's license, mm -hmm. national ID. Moving that proof, of proof of that passport, proof of that uh, ID on chain. And so you can verify that you're of this nationality or verify that you're a passport holder without actually revealing any other information about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, as well, 
Uh, you mentioned that uh, you were assistant for Gary Gensler when <laughs> yes. he, uh, he was teaching in MIT. So yeah. what's your view on the regulations in the US? And it seems the uh, view of Gary Gensler quite shifted on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I know him on uh, a personal level as well. And overall, like as a person, you know, like it's just been an amazing experience. Great to chat with him. Great to just, um, you know, um, he's, he's very personable, very friendly, very humble. Um, and when it comes to work, he's extremely strict. He has very high standards. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very clear juxtaposition between like working with him and like talking with him, which I find very interesting. He's able to be extremely professional. Uh, in terms of regulation, right, like it is a very um, complicated uh, space. Um, you know, like there are obviously things in the Web3 space that people are getting away with today that frankly, I believe they shouldn't. Right? And so like mm -hmm. definitely some form of regulation and compliance and these types of standards are necessary. And the question is just like how, right? And I think that's what people are trying to discover. I don't think I'm in a position to say how, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I am very eager to see how this plays out such that at least we have more clarity. And uh, I suppose the users as well, like where do you see the most your users coming from? Like is it Asia, Europe or US? Um, I'd say most of the users are actually from Asia and parts of um, Europe, mm -hmm. yeah. So do you think this region is much bigger crypto adoption for now? I do think so, yeah. I think that um, you know, in, in, in different regions around the world you have different sentiment when it comes to policy making, when it comes mm -hmm. to just activity. Um, and you know, what I saw recently when I went to Hong Kong uh, for the Web3 Fest there mm -hmm. was that there was this explosion of um, you know, fervor and research and development on new products, new services, all mm -hmm. kind of catalyzed by this optimism through government regulation, the policies mm -hmm. that are being driven. So um, yeah, I think definitely there's a huge opportunity in Asia and parts of Eastern Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree with you. And as well, you claim that uh, you can easily enable uh, Web2 companies uh, to embrace crypto and Web3. So do mm -hmm. you have already any Web2 clients? Um, yeah, so we actually have some uh, mobile applications that are leveraging the ID side. And so they are using the ZKSBTs for verifying real users within their applications. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of these applications is a social chatting app. Um, well, actually several of these applications are social chatting apps that allow mm -hmm. people to um, prove their realness uh, using Manta ZKSBTs. Mm -hmm. And um, as well, how do you see the development of the industry in the next year? Um, in the next year, I think there is quite a saturation of infrastructure right now, right? We are very much focused on the, the foundational technology, um, but I think what is starting to emerge as an issue is where are the users, right? Okay. And so uh, I think one of the areas of focus that I'd like to see, and I hope we head in that direction, is also building more applied use cases. Um, having people actually come and try it out because we're building all these amazing technologies, that's great, but we have no idea if people want them, right? So we have to turn them into actual products um, and the products happen on the application layer. So, you know, that's, that's uh, the final test that we need. And can you tell us well more about products in your ecosystem? Like you have MentorPay, MentorSwap, Exchange, uh, even uh, dating app has matched, yes, yes. that's quite interesting. So yes. can you tell more about all that? Yeah, so um, all the applications that you mentioned already, um, Asmatch is the uh, one of our um, social applications specifically focused on dating um, through, I, I believe, astrology-based focus. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have on the Manta Pacific side, we launched our testnet about um, three, three days ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the first applications on there is called an application called ZK Hold'em, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a on-chain poker game. So you can play poker fully on-chain, peer-to-peer, with mm -hmm. people all around the world. Uh, and so far since that uh, launch on testnet about a day ago, we've seen over 5,000 games being played by people all around the world. So mm -hmm. yeah, really excited for all this growth and all these different ecosystem applications that are enabled by uh, using our uh, identity side on Manta Atlantic, mm -hmm. as well as the, uh, the universal circuits for ZK applications on Pacific. Yeah, that's a quick growth. And can yeah. you share as well some upcoming plans uh, for Manta Network? And as well, when do you plan to launch mainnet? 
Yeah, sure. So um, we are working on um, several different things, I guess. So first, right now, we just recently launched TestNet. So the next step for both Manta Atlantic and Manta Pacific are the uh, mainnet launches, and I think we're very close to getting that ready. Um, mm -hmm. And then beyond that, right, what we want to focus on on the Manta Pacific side is right now our um, ZK, our, our universal circuits are on the contract level and we're trying to bring it down to the infrastructure level. So there's a lot of R&D that goes into that. And then on the Manta Atlantic side, what we're really focusing on is building out more user acquisition for the mm -hmm. identity for these SBTs. Um, so yeah, so Atlantic side is more user growth and um, Pacific side is more product development. Uh, mm -hmm. Hoping to bring in a lot more ecosystem projects as well as we gear towards mainnet launch. Yeah, this is cool. So we'll uh, wait for new updates from Manta Networks. Thank you for interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna.